Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Abralin Online. Uh, Abralin uh, Online or Linguistics Online is an initiative of Brazilian Linguistics Association and uh, is, uh, um, is designed to give students and researchers free access to the state of the art in, in, on the most diverse topics related to the study of human languages. And um, my name is Roberta Pires de Oliveira, and it's a great honor to be here sharing this lecture. And if you have questions, you can make uh, the questions uh, in the chat, and then I will uh, uh, read them, and we can discuss them after uh, uh, Paul Pietrovsky's um, lecture. And it's a really great honor to be here and to present to introduce, I'm sorry, Professor Paul Pietrowski. Uh, he is from Hotikers University and, and he's in philosophy and cognitive science. Uh, most of his research is uh, in the intersection of those two fields, but he has also uh, contribute, contributed to linguistics a lot. And um, uh, uh, I think that uh, it was for me a, ve a very nice surprise to be back, to be, to be the chair, because I had the opportunity of re reading his most recent papers, and I really enjoy them. I, don't, I think they are very interesting, and especially in particular his new book, uh, which is called, called Conjoined Meanings, Semantics Without Truth Values. And this is his uh, uh, mo most recent book. Uh, so it is for me a great honor uh, to introduce Professor Paul Petrovsky, who is going to talk to us today uh, on what are human linguistic meanings and what are theories of meaning theories of. So thank you very much, Professor Paul. Thank you, Abralin, for having this opportunity of being here. And thank you, the audience. Don't forget that we, you can always make questions at the chat. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, <clears throat> Roberta. Uh, let me get my slides up here. Uh, you seeing slides OK? OK. All right, so let me just um, uh, dive uh, right in here uh, and first tell you uh, what's coming. What I'm gonna want to do uh, in this talk is um, focus on human linguistic meanings as opposed to other kinds of significance that we might worry about in the cognitive sciences, and then sketch two conceptions of the meanings that uh, humans connect with uh, pronunciations. I think these conceptions at least broadly will be familiar to linguists. One is a kind of internalist uh, conception uh, according to which meanings are mental representations uh, of a special sort, uh, and the other is an externalist conception according to which meanings are aspects of environments that speakers share and talk about. I'll also want to uh, be discussing four phenomena, three of which are pretty familiar. The phenomenon of homophony, so where we have distinct expressions with distinct meanings sharing a pronunciation. The phenomenon of polysemy, which I'll describe pretty standardly as a single word meaning allowing for subsenses. The phenomenon of compositionality, according to which words can be combined to form um, phrases with uh, sentences, special cases of the big expressions. And then a fourth um, a phenomena that may be a little less familiar that I'll just call formality, that human linguistic expressions seem to exhibit a specific computational format. And in, in that context, I'll be discussing some recent um, uh, experimental work that I've been doing with uh, colleagues. And the idea is that these phenomena taken together are going to favor uh, the internalist picture. So that's what's coming. And the components of the talk will be kind of interwoven as opposed to completely separate um, sections. So let me just start by recognizing there are many kinds of significance that we might want to talk about with the word meaning. Paul Grice uh, right, reminds us that you can use meaning to talk about smoke meaning fire, spots meaning measles, bells meaning that the bus is full, uh, and so on. Uh, we can talk about the meaning of life or what a red light means, uh, the meaning of the French expression, c'est la vie, or, and this is going to be my focus uh, uh, here talking to linguists, the meaning of a word like life or the meaning of a phrase like a red light, which is, of course, very different um, than uh, 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 the red light itself. So I'm going to focus here on expressions of the spoken or signed languages that human children can uh, naturally acquire. 
Those expressions, I assume, connect meanings of some kind with pronunciations of some kind. And I'll take the phenomenon of homophony as an initial indicator of these meanings. For linguists, this will be uh, a kind of familiar point. If I have a pronunciation uh, of the English sentence, a sheriff drew a gun near a bank, um, that might be understood as a sheriff drew in the sense of like unholstered uh, his uh, revolver near a bank, the money institution, or it might be understood uh, a little, maybe a little surprisingly as a sheriff artistically drawing with a pencil, a gun near uh, a river bank. And so we could disambiguate drew and bank either with subscripts or you know, superscripts uh, pictures to just uh, distinguish the various um, meanings we might associate with the word pronunciation drew. Uh, and so you can mix and match and so just because of lexical uh, homophony, a single pronunciation might be associated with multiple uh, meanings. And if we zone in on a particular way of um, disambiguating the lexical items, then we might say um, uh, drew a gun near a bank, even if we're focusing on the sketching uh, uh, a gun near the riverbank, that's still uh, uh, now structurally ambiguous as between um, the uh, draw a gun um, uh, near a bank where a gun near a bank is the constituent and that's what's uh, uh, getting drawn or uh, uh, the uh, uh, meaning where it's um, uh, drew a gun and uh, just the drawing happened to occur uh, near a bank. So that gets us at least, like at least eight meanings that can be connected with the pronunciation of a sheriff drew a gun near a bank. And so here's the question, uh, what are they? Uh, what are those um, various meanings that... Um, uh, English and other languages uh, connect with pronunciations, or if you dislike or distrust talk of meanings and you want to talk about just semantic values or something like that, um, here's the question. What are theories of linguistic meaning theories of? So what are we actually trying to get at when we offer um, uh, theories of meaning? Um, as Chomsky uh, has long pointed out, uh, the phenomenon of structural homophony is, of course, interestingly constrained. So we've got a sentence, if you have a sentence like the duck is eager to eat or the duck is uh, reluctant to eat, that can be understood either as the duck is eater. So the duck somehow understood as the covert subject of eager or the duck is eaten somehow as the covert uh, object uh, of eat. And that's standardly diagnosed as a case of structural homophony. Um, whereas the duck is easy to, um, uh, uh, sorry, the duck is uh, easy or hard to eat there, um, uh, right, uh, sorry, I, I described the uh, eager to eat example as ambiguity. What I mean is it's non-ambiguity. You can't understand um, the uh, sentence as having the duck is eaten meaning, whereas the duck is uh, easy to eat. Um, uh, you, uh, uh, you understand it as having the duck is eaten meaning, and what you can't understand it as having the duck is eater meaning. Had the sentence been the duck is ready to eat, um, then we would have the ambiguity uh, either with the duck as subject of uh, eat or as uh, object. So as Chomsky has long pointed out, this phenomenon of pronunciations getting um, paired with meanings uh, in structurally interesting ways, that's a constrained phenomenon that already suggests that the mind um, uh, is at work there, of course, but that leaves open what we say about the meanings that the mind somehow pairs um, with the pronunciations. Um, so I'll think of structural homoph sorry, homophony, lexical and structural as just my initial guide. Here's what I mean by meanings. Uh, meanings are the things um, uh, that uh, can get paired with pronunciations in these interesting ways. And now here's uh, another way of sharpening up uh, what I've got in mind. Lexical homophony, um, by contrast with structural homophony, seems pretty arbitrary in contrast um, with uh, lexical polysemy. Um, so here are some examples of uh, what I'm going to call lexical polysemy pretty standardly. Uh, if you have a sentence like he dropped the book, uh, he defaced and plagiarized of the book you wrote, where the red book was too heavy to carry and the blue one too hard to read, um, the book he stole was valuable, the book he reviewed was worthless, uh, feels like the word book can either be used to talk about the vehicle, the thing you can uh, drop, or the content, um, the thing you can download. Uh, a likewise, for a word like window, it can be used to talk about a hole or a thing you might buy from the hardware store um, to fill up the hole. And in fact, the word window can take on even um, further uh, extended uh, subsenses. Uh, we talk about the window in front of a store where the stuff is displayed. Um, and we can also talk about a window uh, at a bank uh, where the teller uh, is. So we have this word window, which has what lexicographers call various um, subsenses that don't seem to be arbitrarily uh, uh, 
they, they don't seem to just be arbitrary. There are interesting relations between the vehicle and content interpretation of the book where the hole and filler win, uh, sense as a window. Um, likewise, for a word like line, we can think about lines as perceptible things you can draw on a blackboard or as pure abstractions of the sort you might um, talk about if you're doing a, a theorem in geometry. Or you talk about lines and faces, fishing line, or waiting in a line to buy the fishing line. Um, there's a terrific issue of Lingua in 2015 um, that uh, had a really just nice uh, review of uh, uh, work since 1972 with a really good introduction uh, by the uh, editors along with interesting papers. And in the current issue of Mind and Language, maybe the last issue now, uh, a paper by Jake Quilty Dunn, which will kind of get you up to speed on uh, the phenomenon of polysemy if you're not already up to uh, speed on it. But um, uh, the main thing for my purposes is gonna be to contrast the phenomenon of polysemy with uh, homophony. So again, I'm thinking about polysemy as you've got a single noun like book, and it can be either used in a content or vehicle sense um, intuitively to express a kind of concept of book contents, um, things you might um, be able to download from the internet or a concept of book vehicles, um, things you could again um, uh, drop or uh, uh, purchase from the bookstore. Whereas a uh, bank, um, think about that as the pronunciation uh, is shared by uh, distinct words, uh, the pronunciation bear in English is shared by a bunch of words, an adjective bear, a verb bear, uh, or at least uh, one or more verbs bear, uh, a couple of nouns bear, um, uh, the uh, stock market pessimists or the uh, things you have to watch out for if you're at a walk uh, in the woods. And there, you could think about the pronunciation as being somehow connected to different concepts or ideas or mental representations. But there, the, um, uh, there's, it would be kind of just arbitrary. Uh, and uh, there's no special uh, relation between the riverbank um, uh, concept and the financial bank uh, concept. So we standardly describe that as one pronunciation with corresponding to two more lexical items, each with its own meaning. Again, polysemy, think, I'm thinking about that as a single lexical meaning supporting a family of concepts that you might um, select um, by using uh, that particular lexical item. And so even if you zone in on a particular lexical item like the noun bank, um, there's still like polysemy left over because that could be either used to talk about the building that you can literally bump into or walk into or the uh, institution. So the institution of the Chase Manhattan Bank is different um, than the building that uh, houses any branch uh, of the bank. So a familiar uh, there kind of institution, um, uh, 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 concrete building kind of uh, polysemy. Whereas again, on the uh, homophony side, um, the uh, 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 concepts or uh, meanings, if you like, associated with pronunciation are just arbitrarily uh, related. Um, so in English, um, we've got the uh, word um, so and uh, so, uh, and in French, you've got so, so, and so, uh, but those uh, words uh, have meanings that have nothing to do with uh, uh, one another. I think it's stamp, bunk, bucket, and jump, if I remember right. Um, uh, polysemy is often common across uh, uh, languages. So while not every language that has a verb hold allows for all of the subsenses that English does, um, typically if a language has a verb like hold, it's gonna uh, allow at least um, some of those uh, subsenses uh, for hold. And um, interestingly, uh, polysemy supports a kind of anaphora. So we can say things like the windows that we cut in the walls were nicer than the ones we installed with the word ones referring back to windows, except that in the first part of the sentence, the windows you're talking about uh, are actually the holes that were cut in the walls. Uh, and in the second part of the sentence, you use talking about the things you buy from the hardware store to fill up uh, those holes. So you can do that um, kind of uh, uh, what's called co-predication, use the word window once in the sentence and then have a pronoun referring back to it. Um, and you pick up a different subsense than you used the first time. Can't do that with homophony. Um, it's just a joke to say the banks of the river were nicer than the ones um, that got uh, robbed. So um, again, gonna focus on uh, uh, linguistic meanings uh, with homophony as my initial guide uh, to what they are. We know how to uh, count um, uh, uh, meanings tolerably well. It's not to say there aren't vague cases, but we have a pretty good grip about what we mean by lexical and structural homophony. Um, 
And especially uh, if we've got a contrast uh, with polysemy, uh, then we can know uh, what we're talking about when we're at least a decent idea of what we're trying to get at when we ask what are these meanings that are getting paired with um, pronunciations. With that set up in place, now what I want to just do is walk you through a couple of familiar um, pictures uh, about what those meanings are. One, the internalist picture according to which meanings are mental representations of some kind. And I put individualistic in um, brackets just as a reminder that I mean mental representations of a sort that um, uh, just what's in the head is uh, all that counts. We're not individuating mental representations by what they're representations of, representing representations um, in terms of what's in the head. Whereas on the externalist view, meanings, um, uh, uh, if you wanna talk about them all, on an externalist view, are going to be aspects of the shared environment. Caveat on for the internalist, um, there's an old version of internalism, like back in the 17th and 18th century, where um, people were just thinking meanings are literally uh, just our concepts, and not just the 17th, 18th century, that was Jerry Fodor's view, too. I'm not assuming that if meanings are mental representations, they have to be concepts, they might be more abstract representations like recipes for how to build concepts. And just like a recipe for making cookies might um, call for flour, but which kind of flour you use might be up um, to the baker. Uh, and uh, a recipe for an apple pie might leave it open which kind of um, apples the uh, 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 baker wants to choose for making the pie. Likewise, I'm thinking about the meaning of bank as something that might leave it open which concept of bank you choose on any given occasion. Likewise, uh, the meaning of through a window might leave it open uh, which concept of window uh, you choose when you're building up the complex concept um, through a window. That in place, the internalist are kind of these political expressions. The meanings are actually aspects of the expressions themselves, and theories of meaning are components of um, larger uh, theories uh, of the uh, relevant languages. By contrast, the externalist, um, right, this will be familiar to you from any standard um, semantics textbook in linguistic, is thinking that expressions have semantic values, and they somehow have those values because they're related to the environments in the relevant way. So uh, standardly, you might uh, say the um, uh, semantic value of the word dog is some set of dogs um, uh, in the uh, environment. So you're actually thinking about the things that bark um, as the semantic values uh, of the expressions. From that perspective, polysemy really has to get treated as a kind of non-arbitrary kind of lexical homophony. So if you ask what's the word bank true of, um, right, you'd have to say, well, actually, there's really two separate kinds of expressions, one that's true of the uh, uh, riverbanks and one that's true of the um, uh, 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 financial uh, banks. But then likewise, for window, you have to say, well, there's one word that's true of the whole and another word that's um, true of the fillers or something like that. So if you're an externalist, what you got to do is one way or another treat polysemy as some kind of, there are sub expressions here, each of which um, uh, goes with its uh, own um, semantic value. Um, as I said, there've been uh, old versions of the internalist idea going all the way back to Aristotle, uh, William of Ockham, Leibniz, uh, uh, at least on my reading of him. Uh, but Chomsky has been the most recent um, uh, uh, you know, famous uh, defender of that kind of view. Uh, on the other side, Again, this, this externalism is the standard view offered uh, in semantics textbooks um, and uh, certainly adopted by a lot of linguists. Um, and uh, it's been explicitly uh, was uh, introduced and advocated by a series of philosophers, um, uh, starting with Quine, but then Donald Davidson, David Lewis, um, and famously uh, Hilary Putnam, all associated with the Harvard um, philosophy department. In many ways, that's where semantics externalism comes from, uh, the Harvard philosophy department. And um, uh, one way of sharpening up the uh, difference between the pictures is via Hillary Putnam's famous thought experiment, where we imagine um, uh, two twins, uh, one uh, uh, here uh, on Earth, and then another um, uh, molecular duplicate off on an uh, imaginary planet, Twin Earth, where um, instead of having water that's made up of H2O, the stuff in their lakes and streams is made up of some different um, stuff, so that um, 
uh, the one person is here on earth talking about stuff that is in fact H2O and they call it water uh, on the other planet. Um, the person is, whether they know it or not, talking about stuff with a different chemical composition. They talk about it with the same pronunciation, um, water. Um, Putnam's thought was, well, look, um, those words um, have different semantic values. They're associated with different um, aspects of the relevant environments. And if we suppose that an expression E1 and E2 have different uh, meanings, if that um, shows the expressions are different, then Putnam says that these twins ended up acquiring different languages with expressions that have distinct meanings because their uh, relative, uh, respective words water are just about different kinds of stuff. Um, whereas the internalist says, look, uh, the, uh, uh, these molecular duplicates must have acquired the same language. What really matters is what's in the head. Um, and so the expressions have to have uh, the same meanings um, one way, uh, when uh, well, we get down to describing meanings for purposes of um, studying words. Um, so uh, if you like, there's something both the internalist and externalist can agree on the thing in blue. If the meanings differ, the expressions differ. But then those uh, that gets diagnosed uh, differently. The internalist is going to say Putnam twins have expressions with the same meanings because what's in their head is the same. Uh, the externalist is going to say, nope, they're different meanings because um, the aspects of the world uh, are different. So there's our um, two pictures again. And those two pictures go also with two different conceptions of languages. I'm not gonna say this is true for every internalist and every externalist. You might have some views that do a little mixing and matching, but on the whole, um, semantic uh, externalism um, tends to go with the idea that the languages that humans um, readily acquire uh, are sets of expressions that connect pronunciations with semantic values, what um, Chomsky um, uh, often calls uh, e-languages. Um, David Lewis, uh, uh, a famous early externalist, was absolutely uh, uh, explicit about that. And while there have been uh, uh, attempts to push back on that, I think that's still like where externalism uh, leaves you, that we can talk about that in the question period. By contrast, the internalist tends to think about um, uh, languages in the way that Chomsky called I languages as biologically implemented procedures um, that generate uh, meaningful uh, expressions. So uh, there again is the internalist uh, uh, kind of uh, starting point uh, and the externalist uh, kind of starting point. And now what I want to do is um, talk about a couple of uh, uh, other um, phenomena. Uh, where I think if you think it through, you can see like the internalist and externalist are going to end up saying different things about how to diagnose the phenomena. And the first concerns uh, composition. So if you're an internalist and you're thinking that um, meanings are these features of expressions that get generated by procedures you've got implemented in your head, then it's natural to think that meanings compose in ways we have to discover that humans are gonna employ very specific combinatorial operations. We gotta go find out what they are. And that the, the phenomena we call compositionality is at bottom a natural biological phenomenon. By contrast, internalists tend to say that, look, if you have a language that generate, a language with endlessly many expressions, of course, your theory of meaning, the thing you write down on the blackboard or in your textbook has to specify the semantic values recursively. It's got to pair pronunciations of the language with aspects of the environment. And if you've got endlessly many pronunciations and endlessly many aspects of the environment, you're going to have to write down the specification in some recursive way. But the externalists have traditionally said how you specify that mapping between pronunciations and aspects of the environment is pretty much a matter of choice. Um, as long as you get the basic um, pairings right, how you do it is up to you um, as a theorist. So it's common for externalists to say that extensionally equivalent theories, that is theories that pair the same pronunciations um, with the same aspects of the environment are equally correct, or at least equally correct once you allow for possible worlds so that we can say that um, uh, for a, a, a theory of uh, meaning uh, to be adequate, what it's got to do is pair pronunciations with the right um, uh, uh, extensions of the right semantic values across every possible world, at least if you allow that, then most um, uh, contemporary externalists um, say, well, look, if you have uh, any, way of, any way of getting those um, pronunciation semantic value um, facts uh, right is as good as any other. 
By contrast, internalists tend to think, look, um, uh, we're not trying to pair pronunciations with aspects of the environment. We're trying to pair pronunciations, if we're giving a theory of meaning, with mental representations. And the form of the mental representation is going to matter. And the way in which you um, uh, compose the mental representations is what we're trying to get at when we give a theory of meaning. And so merely having um, a recursively specifiable um, theory is not good enough. Um, uh, this would be a separate talk to develop in detail, but for those of you um, that uh, remember or at least know um, Chomsky's uh, discussion from 1959, where he talked about kinds of recursion, part of his point there was that if we're studying human languages, mere recursion, merely talking about recursion or computability, that's not enough. We got to get to the right flavor of recursion or computability uh, when we're talking about human languages. And likewise, if you're an internalist about meaning, you just don't wanna write down any old algorithm that pairs um, pronunciations with um, semantic properties of some kind. You wanna do it in a way that um, uh, captures the way actual speakers um, do the compositions in their head. This is related to um, what's turned out to be, I think, a quite important distinction that's coming out in a lot of the literature in and around an experimental semantics. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, in a few slides that if you're an internalist, even if you had two theories that were provably equivalent in terms of how they paired pronunciations with um, aspects of the environment, that still might not, there still might be um, uh, important work to get done about picking out which um, theory was more plausible psychologically. Whereas an internalist is gonna say, look, if you've got two ways of writing down how pronunciations get paired with semantic values and they're provably equivalent, well then they're just equally good as theories of meaning. If humans happen to represent the mapping one way as opposed to another, that's, um, uh, if you like, a mere psychological difference and not a difference we have to worry about um, when we're writing down our um, theories of meaning. What I want to do is um, talk about those um, two phenomena in a little bit in inverted order. So I'll start with the second point um, that I'm pointing at, at the bottom of the slide, and then I'll come back to that um, uh, kind of abstract point about composition in just a little bit. What I want to do is first give you a flavor of, so to speak, the kinds of facts externalists are going to say, look, they might be interesting for cognitive science, but it's not part um, of a theory of... Um, so here's a picture of a bunch of dots, some yellow, some blue. Um, and if I ask you, are most of the dots yellow? Um, pretty easy uh, answer. Um, and uh, you might wonder, how do you come up with the answer? So like given uh, that picture, how do you come up with um, uh, uh, the answer uh, is yes. And so here's one thought you might have. You understand most of the dots are yellow is something like the yellow dots outnumber the non-yellow dots. And you figure out either by counting or guesstimating that there's uh, more yellow, uh, more uh, uh, yellow dots than uh, non-yellows. Um, here's another way you might um, uh, come up with the answer. You might say, um, well, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence with leftovers between the yellow dots and the uh, non-yellow dots. Um, so there I've written, uh, put some red lines uh, connecting uh, each uh, blue dot with a yellow. And you see there's some yellows left over. That'd be one way of find, uh, deciding that most of the dots are yellow. Uh, or you might um, try to uh, figure out if more than half of the dots are yellow. Or you might do a complicated thing of um, asking whether the number of yellow dots, that is nine, exceeds the result of a certain computation, that the number of the dots minus the number of the yellow dots, uh, uh, so that nine is bigger than 15 uh, minus nine. Um, in a couple of papers um, from a while uh, back, uh, and together with um, uh, colleagues, uh, um, uh, we argued that, in fact, in a lot of experimental um, settings anyway, uh, uh, the procedure people actually use is this complicated subtraction um, procedure. And that work's been you know, replicated in, uh, in labs other than ours. Um, now, one response to that kind of work, say, well, like, that's fascinating uh, about how people uh, answer questions. But even if uh, all humans would do it that way in certain settings, um, that doesn't show anything about the meaning of most. 
that just shows about how you happen to uh, uh, get the question uh, answered. Um, but that's a kind of fact, if you like, that an internalist might go, oh, let me hear more about that because that might tell me something about the format of the mental representations that we pair with the pronunciation most, where the externalist is gonna say, look, those various ways of specifying most were um, equivalent. Uh, and so they can't um, uh, make a difference with regard to meaning. So that was, so to speak, uh, one word, several possible uh, representations. You might also ask um, uh, if you've got three different words, say for universal quantification, each, every, uh, and all, um, uh, right? How do um, speakers, uh, what, you know, what strategies will people use to answer questions uh, if they're faced with those words. So, you know, you might um, uh, think, well, one thing you might do with a universal quantifier is just understand it in terms of what logicians would call a first order quantifier for every single thing in the domain that's a circle, it is also yellow. Or you might think in terms of comparison of sets, the set of circles is a perhaps improper um, uh, subset of the set of uh, yellow things. Sorry, it should be the other way uh, around uh, that the yellow things are a subset of the circles. Um, or you might think of it in terms of uh, saying, well, look, maybe I should be finding out if the set of circles is identical to the set of yellow circles. That's what would be true if every circle is yellow. Or you might think about something super complicated like the circles. That's what that garbage on the left there means. The circles are such that every one of them is yellow. Now, these are all um, equivalent formulations. Uh, they're logically, uh, each is logically equivalent to the others. And so from an externalist perspective, it wouldn't matter. Anybody that represents a universal quantifier in any of those ways is doing the same thing so far as meaning uh, is concerned. Uh, in a pair of um, uh, papers, uh, one of which is gonna come out in linguistics and philosophy and another from a recent um, SALT proceedings uh, together with uh, uh, you know, a, a team of us uh, argued, actually um, uh, uh, there are differences here uh, each goes with that uh, first meaning I put up every, each particular one is yellow and uh, every and all work um, differently. I don't wanna try to adjudicate that debate here. Um, again, what I'm just trying to do at the moment for, for today is get on the table um, the kinds of facts where if you're an externalist about meaning, you gotta say, those facts might be interesting for cognitive science, but they're not things we have to worry about in providing a theory of meaning because all we want to provide in the theory of meaning is how to relate a word like most or every to some um, aspect of reality, in this case, some um, logical uh, aspect of reality. And however you code it is up to you, the theorist. Uh, anyway, anything that gets um, the uh, uh, gets us uh, pairing the right pronunciations um, with the right semantic values. And so in particular, the right pronunciations of sentences with the right truth conditions any way of doing it that gets the facts right, gets the facts right. And you don't have to worry uh, about the details about how speakers uh, mentally represent um, the uh, truth conditions or the contribution of every. That, if you like, is some other uh, enterprise. Or for the internalist, you'd be thinking, ah, right, since my job is to pair pronunciations and giving a theory meaning, my job is to pair pronunciations with mental representations, I might have to go find out what mental representations um, uh, speakers uh, have, right? So that's what I've got in mind by saying the internalist um, thinks that even provably equivalent um, theories uh, need not be notational variants, whereas the externalist is going to be thinking there are a lot of psychological differences that just aren't going to count as um, semantic um, differences. Turning to this point about composition, right? The uh, externalist, uh, again, agrees they might have to specify their uh, semantic values uh, recursively, but they're gonna think there's a lot of room for theoretical choice in how you do it. The internalist is gonna say, look, there might be some fact of the matter about how humans do it, and it's our job to get at that fact, even if that means um, going beyond uh, specifying pairings of pronunciations with aspects of the environment. So here, consider the familiar um, fact that a sentence like a brown dog barked implies that a dog barked, that argument, uh, is valid, and think about you know two um, ways you might um, try to describe that, uh, right? Described in any um, standard semantics textbook. Um, one way is to think when you stick an adjective together with a noun, you get a noun phrase, 
And now um, uh, you might think the adjective brown um, gets paired with some uh, mental predicate uh, brown, and likewise for dog, and that modifying a noun with an adjective signifies a kind of restriction. So you actually can join uh, uh, brown with dog at some level of mental representation. Another way, uh, uh, right, deriving from uh, work uh, by uh, Montague uh, and Hans Kamp and Terry Parsons uh, in the 1970s is to think about it in terms of type shifting. And you say, right, stick that adjective together with noun to get um, the uh, phrase brown dog. And dog is, gets us paired with some sort of function uh, that involves the dogs. And brown gets paired with some like fancier function that takes a dog function into um, uh, a function that's specified in terms of uh, brown. So on that, from that perspective, uh, you'd think of modifying a noun with an adjective as a kind of saturation. In the, on that second picture, um, adjective brown serves as a kind of higher order predicate that takes dog as an argument and then uh, returns to you uh, uh, some function involving the brown dogs, right? Details not super important today. Um, we know there are these two ways of writing down what the contribution of sticking an adjective together with a noun is. One in terms of what's called restriction, predicate modification in the uh, Hyman Kratzer uh, textbook. They've got a, a rule that works this way. The other way would think of it in terms of um, saturation or what's often called function application. And very often you'll see people, including even in the Hyman Kratzer textbook, them saying, this is notational choice. Uh, you can think of it as you like. Is it the sticking two words together that signifies a kind of conjunction? Or is it the word brown itself when it functions as an adjective has the conjunction built into it um, and the uh, relevant operation uh, is saturation, uh, not uh, restriction. That too is gonna to be a kind of thing where the externalist um, is gonna say, well, look, um, uh, theorist choice, as long as you get the facts right, um, write it down as you like. And the internalist is gonna say, look, I wanna know um, uh, how in fact, um, uh, uh, combining uh, adjectives with nouns gets understood in terms of the mental representations uh, that we construct. And so what I wanna now do is just mention a kind of fact, again, that's not decisive, but a kind of fact that the externalist I think has to say, yeah, that's kind of cognitively interesting, but it has nothing essentially to do with meaning where uh, an internalist is gonna say, this is a kind of interesting fact and it might have something essentially to do with meaning. Uh, and it's the generalization that for expressions, longer tends to be stronger. So uh, you have a sentence like a dog chased a cat, a dog that barked chased a gray cat, a dog that barked loudly when the lamp fell chased a gray cat that saw the brown mouse, right? As you keep adding modifiers to either um, dog or cat, right? What you get is this phenomenon of the longer sentences implying um, the shorter ones, uh, but not conversely. To be sure, there are exceptions. So if we say the dog chased the cat and extend with if the lamp fell, now the longer sentence is not long, logically stronger than the shorter one. Likewise, for expressions like unless or never, or if we stick things like it was thought that in front. So it's not to say that every way of making a sentence longer makes the sentence um, uh, logically stronger. You can obviously weaken or do other things um, to sentences by adding uh, 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 conditions with if, uh, disjunction with unless or or uh, negation or um, fancy uh, operators like uh, it was thought that. But those really do, I think, seem like special cases that are coded by special linguistic devices. If we think about open-ended modification, so think about not the condition if the lamp fell, but relative clause modification, like the dog chased the cat when the lamp fell. Um, and not special words like never, but you're just, you know, garden variety um, uh, adverbs and adje uh, adjectives, uh, in this case, adverbs like happily, reluctantly, happily, but hopelessly. Um, when you modify that way, you do get the phenomena that the longer sentence is logically stronger than the uh, uh, shorter sentence. Um, this is a point I talk a, about uh, a lot in that recent book um, that Roberta uh, kindly mentioned uh, at the beginning. Um, and that sort of seems a lot like discourse 
So if you have a story in which you say the mouse ate some cheese, the cat saw the mouse, the dog chased the cat, as the discourse gets longer, um, the story gets logically stronger, right? There'd be a, a lousy system that says when you tell a story, every time you add a sentence, you uh, had to be understood disjunctively. And so the story got logically weaker as you went along. It can happen once in a while. You say the dog chased the cat and then back off, or so it seemed until it was discovered that the alleged cat was really a fox. So we do have these locutions like, or so it seemed, alleged, never, unless, if. But I think it's a pretty good case to be made that those are the special cases that get added to a system in which the basic, when you do the open-ended modification pattern, is that as the sentence get longer, they get logically stronger. That's a kind of fact that if you're uh, an externalist, and you say, well, that's kind of like interesting. Humans happen to speak languages in which it works that way, but that's not really essential to the meaning because if it's theorist's choice, whether or not um, you're doing your composition in terms of saturation or function application, as opposed to say doing it in terms of uh, conjunction and restriction, if it's theorist's choice, just get the truth conditions right any way you like, it's fine. Um, You've got no way then to say uh, the reason uh, expressions, longer expressions tend to be stronger is that on the whole, when you go from dog to dog that barked and cat to gray cat, what you're doing is employing a specific operation of uh, restriction. Uh, and then that's just um, a part and parcel of how humans uh, understand expressions. So again, don't wanna suggest that that's decisive. What I would just do is get you a sense that's yet another kind of um, a way in which the internalist picture differs from the externalist picture. Namely, the internalist is going to say composition is this natural biological phenomenon, and we got to roll up our sleeves and find out what the character of that phenomenon is. And that's part of our job as semanticists. The externalist who's thinking, look, um, I'm not in the business of telling you what goes on in your head. I'm in the business of just pairing pronunciations with aspects of the environment and telling you that's um, uh, uh, the way uh, the language works at that level of abstraction. The externalist can say, look, I'm not um, going to uh, commit to any particular um, uh, account of how uh, compositionality uh, works in human uh, languages. That itself goes with this um, idea that you often find associated with semantic externalism, that languages are somehow for communication, that the point of having a language is that it lets people with different mental representations um, communicate with one another by sort of triangulating on common aspects of a shared uh, environment. Um, and if you're thinking about meaning as fundamentally tied to communication, and you recognize there can be cognitive differences across individuals, then it's kind of natural to think about meanings as abstracting away from psychology and focusing on the shared pronunciation to stuff in the world um, connections that speakers of a language can share. On the other hand, if you're an internalist, um, you're gonna be much more likely to think of languages as cognitive tools. Uh, and that, uh, you know, as Chomsky uh, and then uh, sometimes together with Bob Berwick have been suggesting lately, maybe even we had ancestors who had um, human languages uh, as grammars inside the head that were not yet used for talking. They were really just were used uh, uh, for cognition. Um, if you're an internalist and you're thinking of languages fundamentally as cognitive tools that we can use for communication, and we do now use for communication, but um, they're not essentially tied to communication. Then when you hear this slogan that's often um, uh, uh, circulates, that a theory of meaning should be taken to be a theory of understanding, that's the kind of thing that the externalist is gonna say, yes, a theory of meaning should be a theory of understanding, but that means theories of meaning should specify how speakers of a language interpret each other for purposes of communication. That is, we understand cat as this noise that's associated with the things that meow, dog is uh, as this noise that's associated with the things that go woof. Uh, we uh, understand the noise eager to, eager to eat as this um, uh, noise that gets associated with things that are eager to do um, some eating, but that's the level at which a theory of meaning should be a theory of understanding. It's 
your theory of meaning should specify how speakers of a language are coordinating with each other for purposes of communication. And that means specifying relations between pronunciations and aspects of a shared environment. By contrast, the internalist is gonna be thinking, look, we use languages for communication, but that's not the primary um, uh, thing we sh should be focused on when we're offering theories of meaning. That's so to speak, a later thing we do with languages. What meanings really are these mental representations we're pairing with the mental representations. And so theories of meaning are under theories of understanding in the cognitive science sense that we want our theories of meaning to explain how individuals comprehend linguistic expressions. How do they actually construct up uh, mental representations um, that go with the pronunciations? And the mapping between those mental representations and the environment might be very, very complicated, if only because of things like um, polysemy. So what I've been trying to do um, uh, now in this first uh, uh, right, three, three quarters of the hour is just build up these um, uh, two uh, pictures. Again, right, we can talk uh, later about how we can have mixed and matched um, views. But I think these two pictures are pretty like powerful and out there and they certainly have um, advocates and they correlate with um, what have become with uh, two uses of semantics one of which um, is kind of goes back at least in English to the 19th century, and the other is associated with um, Ray Tarski and the kind of formal semantics tradition that you'll have been exposed to in any um, standard uh, semantics textbook. Um, and uh, I just mentioned this because sometimes there's this um, terminological hang up of people thinking, well, look, semantics just means stuff having to do with truth. And so I just want to flag for you that um, for a long time, there have been ways of using um, talk of semantics and semantic properties to just talk about discovered properties of ordinary expressions with no interesting connection to uh, uh, truth, at least not in any theoretically interested sense. Tarski, when he did his great work uh, in the 30s uh, and 40s, showed us how you could um, uh, have a notion of semantics that was tied to truth. And in fact, his point in, was to give us uh, uh, a notion, show that a notion of truth could be scientifically legitimate. I and mean, prior to the 1930s, people thought that talk of truth, that's kind of spooky precisely because it's wrapped up with this ordinary notion of meaning. And so what in fact Tarski had done for us was show us that what he called the semantic conception of truth, and this was a novel use of semantic that he introduced, um, the semantic conception of truth um, could be something you use to show that a notion of truth was scientifically legit, but you did that for invented languages where you got to stipulate the semantic properties and you treated sentences as the super special units of, um, uh, of, uh, uh, of significance, that they were by stipulation things that were true or false. And for Tarski, he's thinking, look, this is for invented languages that forbid polysemy, and uh, it's guaranteed that word-sized ex expressions have extensions. We're on the older and actually initial use of the word semantics, people were just thinking semantics just like, just like a, like a you know, extra term for meaning. Uh, and it was supposed to be compatible with polysemy, no assumptions uh, that word meanings um, determine uh, extensions. And so if you've come across the idea that, um, well, look, you got to say the truth or falsity of an utterance of a sentence is determined by the semantic properties of the sentence and its context uh, of utterance. Um, that too is like one of these slogans that the um, uh, internalist using uh, semantics in the pre tarskian way can agree with. But then that kind of um, a theorist is going to say, but yeah, but context in that sense include everything that's relevant to truth except meaning. Um, and on the other side, people say, no, no, what you really want to do is characterize a notion of context so that we can say that semantic properties determine reference conditions um, relative to context, right? So again, this is something we want to talk about in the question period, but I want just to get it out there that um, uh, there are multiple and have been multiple uses of semantics um, for a long while. Um, and on some of those uses, you don't suppose uh, that meanings uh, determine uh, reference, even though meaning sets up the conditions for reference. And on another use, uh, more associated with externalist, you suppose that meanings do, in fact, determine uh, uh, extensions uh, relative to context. Okay, so time remaining, what I want to do 
is now say a little bit more about this um, uh, formality condition uh, and some experimental work um, uh, that I think really just does point in the direction of the uh, internalist picture. And everything else I'm gonna say from the last 10 minutes now, this is uh, collaborative work um, with uh, uh, former graduate students, uh, Tim Hunter, Tyler Knowlton, uh, Alexis Wellwood and Darko uh, Odich, uh, and my uh, uh, friends and collaborators at uh, Johns Hopkins University of Maryville and Justin Halbert and Jeff Lids. So I mentioned earlier um, this thought, this uh, point that there are various ways in which word like most might get understood and that there were some uh, studies uh, showing that at least in some context where you just flash dots at people, give them about 200 milliseconds to answer and then um, uh, uh, see how they answer. Turns out you can, um, and happy to talk about the details afterwards, um, but you can get evidence that in those settings anyway, uh, what people are actually doing is going through this uh, uh, process of estimating the number of yellow dots and comparing it to um, their estimate of the total number of dots uh, minus the yellows. Uh, and the key finding uh, in that uh, those early papers was that um, even when uh, other strategies for answering the questions would be usable and better, so even if like a one-to-one -one correspondence or compare the yellows to the blues strategies would give you better uh, answers, um, subjects just really quite reliably uh, and uh, stick with um, uh, uh, a strategy of estimating cardinalities and subtracting. Uh, and it seemed that the word most uh, really does elicit those um, strategies, at least in the uh, uh, experimental context we looked at. But as I also mentioned before, um, one reply is, well, look, okay, that's what people do if you give them 200 milliseconds. Um, uh, but is there any independent evidence that across all sorts of contexts, uh, the word most gets understood in a distinctive way? So it'd be the word itself that's a triggering attention to that superset of all the dots. Because that was the, the uh, key finding from the early papers that when you hear the word most, whether you like it or not, you're gonna take into account the full 15 um, dots and use that um, uh, estimate of the total number of dots in answering uh, whether or not most of the dots uh, are yellow. So question is, is there independent evidence that the word most uh, actually does that and does it in a way that like other um, words in the vicinity uh, would not? And so now what I wanna do is tell you about um, uh, some uh, results reported in a paper uh, that we just learned has been accepted uh, at the uh, uh, Annals for the New York Academy of Science. So it's forthcoming, uh, but it's been uh, accepted there. Um, the, uh, uh, here's an experiment where you're just gonna get, you just present people with two pictures of the 15, uh, of, of all those dots, it's the same number of blues and yellows in the A and B. The only difference is that in A, they've been grouped together and in B, they've been segregated. And so you just ask people, which picture is the better example of, and now in one bunch of studies, it's just directly most of the dots are blue or more of the dots are blue. So just more, most, that's the only difference between the sentence. You just gotta pick which picture is the better example of those two sentences. Or you might ask people, pick which of these pictures are the better example of most of the dots are blue. And now with the more long-winded, there are more blue dots. Uh, than yellow dots. It turns out not to matter which pair you give them. Um, uh, the answer uh, uh, quite dramatically is that there's heavy preference for picture um, A uh, as the better example for most of the dots are blue and picture B as uh, for more. As if when you hear more, what you really wanna do is compare the number of blues to the number of yellows without having to worry about the total number of dots. Whereas with most, what you want is everything together so you can get a, uh, uh, an estimate of the total number of dots, even if that means mixing up, um, mixing up the colors. And it's known independently that putting those boxes around the dots as in B, uh, in the B picture frustrates the visual system in getting an estimate of the total number of dots. Picture A, it's independently known um, helps the visual system uh, get an estimate of the total number of dots. So kind of interesting if when you just ask people, which is the better example, uh, and now the min minimal pair, most versus more, uh, A is the most picture, B is the most picture. Works the other way around too. Um, if you uh, uh, give people um, 
a, a, a picture and then ask them to choose a sentence. So give them A and ask them to pick the most sentence or the more sentence or give them B and ask them to pick the most sentence or the more sentence. It's the same thing. A is the one that goes with most and B is the one that goes with more. This is not just about recognition. Um, if you, uh, this is back uh, uh, when people were still excited about playing with uh, iPads. Uh, if you give people um, uh, uh, a chance to just draw and now tell them your job is to make somebody else say, condition one, more of the dots are blue for the other bunch of subjects. Their job is to get somebody else to say most of the dots are blue. And now you just want to just, just put dots on the iPad. So you could by um, pressing uh, uh, your finger on the pad, create pictures. That's a kind of typical picture that people would create if they were asked to make somebody else say more of the dots are blue. That's a typical picture. If you ask them to make somebody say most of the dots are blue. And so you can, with uh, lots and lots of trials, now just get a measure about how much people segregate the dots if you ask them to make a picture of more of the dots or blue and how much they intermix um, uh, the dots if it's most. Uh, and you know, huge statistical uh, significance, people separate out uh, for more in that way that makes uh, it easy to compare the colors, but harder to take account of the total number. And with most, they uh, push things together in that way that makes it easier to get a measure of the total uh, number of uh, dots. This is not just true for adults. Uh, it was true uh, for a group of four to eight year olds. So at the young age, these are kids who are really just um, uh, understanding the word more, most for the first uh, time. Same phenomenon uh, as with the adults. Uh, most have stuff together, more have it apart. Uh, and again, this is where the kids are making pictures uh, uh, to uh, illustrate the sentences. But you might say, okay, that shows there's a more most uh, contrast, but is that contrast detectable holding the stimulus fixed? So could you hold a single picture fixed and now have a minimal pair most versus more and still elicit some kind of um, contrast reflecting differences in understanding? Because you should really should be able to do that if the contrast is due to how the words are being understood. So if it really just is peculiar to how you understand the word most, as opposed to the pretty similar word um, more, um, uh, if it's most that's making you attend to the superset, the total number of dots, well, then you ought to be able to find uh, that out. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, you can. So um, uh, you now with kids, uh, this is also replicated with adults, um, Give them a picture like in A, and uh, right, half of them are going to get a more sentence, half get a uh, most sentence. And then here's the task. You're just going to see the picture. And then after it goes away, point to the center of where the blues are uh, or point to the center of where um, the yellows uh, are. And, um, and it turns out that uh, uh, right, um, kids are, um, uh, uh, there's a, this dramatic difference of um, right, kids um, being um, uh, better with one uh, rather than uh, the other in the predicted uh, way. So what you can do is get the kids to just put their finger um, where they think the center of the blues was and where the center of the yellows was, even though the yellows uh, were never uh, named. Um, and they're uh, way better um, uh, at doing that uh, with uh, 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 more than most. Um, suggesting that uh, right, the most um, sentences having them uh, attend to the full uh, superset where the more sentences is getting them to zone in on which are the blues uh, and which are the yellows. So uh, relevant to remember here on our proposal about what most means, um, you're not asked to attend to the yellows at all because you're pairing the blues to the total number minus the blues, where with more, the proposal is you're comparing the blues, of course, to the non-blues, in this case, the yellows. So you should, uh, with more, uh, have attended to yellows. And uh, prediction with most, you got no clues uh, where the yellows were, and that's um, borne out with the kid data. Um, perhaps most dramatically uh, with adults, um, on particular holding the stimuli the same. So you, know, you just keep asking adults, you're just gonna answer yes or no, are more of the dots blue or yellow, or for the other half of the subjects, are most of the dots blue? It's exactly the same stimuli for both um, groups of subjects. All that differs is the tense test sentence. 
And uh, now what we find out is that the um, uh, subjects who got the most sentence perform worse on just answering the question yes or no than uh, the subjects who got the more sentence. So here's a question, why on earth should um, speakers be better at answering the more question, holding the stimuli fixed? But if you stop and think about this, you realize, well, look, um, the number of yellow dots on average is gonna be way smaller than the uh, total number of dots. And we know that animals, humans included, are gonna be better than at estimating the number of yellow dots than at estimating the total number of dots. Because if you have to estimate nine, that's one thing, um, pretty easy. If you have to estimate uh, 18, um, that's a, a lot harder. So getting an estimate of the total number of dots, that's gonna like um, really uh, tax uh, your system and you're not gonna be nearly as good as that as you will be as just comparing the yellows. So comparing to the blues to the yellows uh, is an easier task than comparing the blues to now estimate the total number and subtract um, out the blues, right? And so uh, our conclusion uh, is that uh, in fact, uh, the more sentence did not prompt speakers to worry about the total number of dots, but the most uh, 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 sentences did prompt speakers to worry about the total number of dots. And when you dig in and uh, uh, um, compare to um, off the shelf models about, you know, what you'd, how people's, perform what performance you would expect um, if uh, people were uh, relying on the large numbers. Uh, it fits that uh, blue curve quite nicely. And if you uh, uh, ask what you'd expect um, if people were not worrying about the total numbers, but just comparing blues to yellows, it fits that uh, orange curve um, quite nicely. That seems to me um, a kind of evidence that um, an internalist uh, can offer to say, look, um, theories that have the same consequences for the yes, no conditions for sentences across all possible worlds, right? There's only two colors. The difference between most of the dots are blue and more of the dots are blue is a difference, if you like, in linguistic formulation. It's not anything about how the noise is related uh, to the environment. And yet it does seem that the word most just um, forces mental representations that the word more does not. Um, and it's hard to see what could be doing that um, except for the meanings of the words. That makes me quite skeptical of the general idea that psychological differences uh, are not uh, semantic differences. And if you pair that with the fact that the externalist had to actually initially say, yeah, I really want to just treat polysemy as some kind of uh, uh, non-arbitrary lexical homophony, because I really want uh, to think of my uh, individual words as having extensions, that seems to me to be a worry too. Now, none of this is gonna be decisive, right? We're gonna just need lots and lots of uh, work uh, over the uh, next however uh, many years um, uh, trying to develop these uh, points. But I hope I've at least given you a flavor of uh, uh, like how the pictures um, differ and the kinds of things that can be relevant um, to defending uh, an internalist uh, conception. So I've gone uh, an hour now, I will stop. Uh, so here's a summary, right? I just tried to uh, sketch the two pictures uh, of meanings. I'm happy to talk about um, a fancier uh, mixed version of the question period. But I think if you think about these four big phenomena, homophony, polysemy, compositionality, and then formality, which we, I think we can get experimentally. If you think of those together, I think the net result is pointing in the direction of internalist conceptions of meaning. Thanks. Thank you, Paul, for this nice uh, presentation. And now we open for questions and comments. Um, so maybe we wait a little bit for people to put the questions, to make questions. I have lots of comments and questions. Mm. So <laughs> maybe I can start. And then, please, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, OK, I, I understand your arguments. I, I'm, I have different types of questions, but I do understand your uh, point about internalism. And I, um, I think that uh, most of us in semantics, uh, we are in this direction of being more uh, 
internalist in a sense. So now we have lots of questions there. And you, you said that you were going to talk about the possibilities in between, because this is an it's externalist that is a real externalist, right? And, um, and but we, we, can, we have other types of, we have people that uh, somehow talk about truth values or at least truth conditions and so at least some sort of reference, uh, but they do accept the internalist perspective. I think yeah. here about like, like Kierke and his way of doing indirect semantics, and he gets the same results that you that you get about um, Twin Earth and uh, water, HDO, and all that kind. So maybe you can talk a little bit about yeah, those. Good, good. Yeah, good. So so look, uh, yeah, Gennaro is a wonderful force. Uh, for good. Um, he's been um, taking mental representation seriously for a long while. Likewise, uh, for people like Irena Heim, like all the way back to her mm -hmm. dissertation. So I, it, I, I totally agree. When you talk to leading semanticists at the conference, they will say, look, we all sort of agree there's something right about this internalist picture. One thing I do want to say is the textbooks do not read this way. The textbooks read as if we're telling the graduate students, semantics is this externalist enterprise. And you can add a little bit of, if you like, cognitive science salt at the end, if you like. But that I think creates the picture. And I think this also is, is a kind of, it's a picture that say Gennaro does um, uh, uh, maintain if I understand him correctly. Uh, and that uh, Barbara Parti, uh, if I understand her correctly too. No, no. The initial externalist picture, externalist picture is fine as far as it goes. We really are pairing pronunciations with aspects of the environment truth conditions. It's just that we can also think about these internalist questions. Um, and so that's one thing we can, we can do, though I'm inclined to think that the phenomenon of polysemy um, and various facts which suggest that uh, uh, meanings don't determine extensions relative to context suggest rather that we should not be sort of taking the traditional externalist picture as right as far as it goes and adding some internalism after the fact. I think it's more, we should be thinking about the theory of meaning as really targeting a component of mind. And now it's a question to what degree is talk of truth conditions a harmless idealization for the first semantics class? And to what degree is it actually true, <laughs> right? So we can, of course, say, let's pretend words are not polysemous. Let's pretend I here and now illustrate context sensitivity, and that's the end of it. Um, but I guess I'm inclined to think that once you've taken on as much internalism as I'm inclined to take on, then what we have to go back and ask is, was it ever true that the sentences had truth conditions? Was it ever true that there is this um, level of abstraction that makes it appropriate to just talk about the pronunciations in the world and leave the mind um, for later? And, and I'm quite skeptical uh, about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I would love to to continue talking about this, especially yeah. because I had this interview with Gennaro Kerke yeah. and we discussed exactly that. And it's, I, I'm going to send, but no, 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 I hope we can get back to it because I actually think that is the question going forward. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm sure yeah. there are other stuff yeah, to get but, in. Yeah, there, there are lots of other questions here. So um, um, uh, Professor Gitana Brito Bezeja said, thank you for this inspiring talk. And she wants to know whether, do you think an internalist view of meaning could be more productive than an externalist view of meaning when we consider the relationship between the parser and grammar? Yeah, great, great. That, that's, a, that's a great yeah. question. Yeah, that, uh... So uh, look, in general, um, I think my view is, uh, you know, we measure the productivity of research programs by seeing what new and exciting questions um, they generate in ways that lead uh, to answers. And this is like one of my reasons for, for initially being dissatisfied with externalism. It seemed to say, uh, uh, once you've got the truth conditions right, well, then you're done. And then it's some, everything else is a different project. On the 
parsing front, I think that in fact, there's tons of uh, interesting stuff to be asked here from an internal perspective, right from the question, should we think about parsing as fundamentally pairing a pronunciation with um, you know, some kind of syntactic structure uh, and then now somehow finding a way to interpret it? Or should we actually be thinking about parsing as, look, the child is not in the business of doing homework in a syntax class uh, at every moment. What the child wants to do is get to a decent representation of what got said um, in the context. Now, you know, like as with lots of people, I think you can't cut straight from the pronunciation to a pragmatically enriched uh, representation of what got said without some intermediaries. You're going to need to like do a little bit of structure stuff. But if you're an internalist who thinks that meanings are something like recipes for how to build representations, then you might think, yeah, maybe we should be thinking about parsing as a process of pairing the pronunciation pretty directly with a recipe for um, how to build a thought. And while you're trying to construct that recipe on the fly, you're constantly going back and now thinking about how to resolve the polysemy um, with the information you've got going. Because if you're an internalist of at least my flavor, you're thinking that the meaning underdetermines the thought to be assembled because you have to deal with the polysemy of window over here. You got to deal with the polysemy of other words over there. And so I think it'd be like just really exciting to think about um, uh, how, uh, how um, you might construct in a semantic internalist parser where what you were doing is on the fly trying to construct a recipe for a thought and simultaneously on the fly, try to figure out how to execute that recipe um, with particular conceptual uh, ingredients. And then once that got going, then think about the kind of um, pragmatic enrichment. So far as I know though, that would not require as an intermediary step to just uh, uh, work out the syntactic um, structure. Because if the recipe is isomorphic to the syntactic structure, um, uh, you might not need to do that um, uh, semantic somewhere. But I'd, I'd love to talk separately with anybody who's got um, uh, ideas about um, uh, what you might think of as um, uh, semantic internalist parsing. Uh, great question. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be understood about this semantic processing and how it happens. And yeah. So I have a question from Selene Rodriguez who says hi. Paul. Hey, Selene. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Great says, to hear with you, you at, at, this, yeah. at this long distance. Yeah. So uh, she wants, oh, she has many questions. Okay. Um, so she Selene has. Selene always question. had many questions. Yeah. <laughs> she has a question about uh, the contrast between two sentences. Okay, in a restaurant. A customer says to the waiter, one, sentence one, as for the water, I will go with watermelon, watermelon juice. And she says, this is okay. Sorry, uh, say the sentence again. As for water. Yeah. I will go with watermelon juice. Okay. And the second one is, as for water, I will go with watermelon. And she says, this is not okay. It is okay with watermelon juice, but it's not okay with, uh, without the juice. So she's asking um, uh, whether our mental representations of water has to be somehow linked to our mental representations of juice yeah. or watermelon juice. Good, okay, so I'll, I'll just work my own intuitions as I can I can get both of them, but only because I think I probably fill Put in that. fill in yeah. the uh, yeah. juice. So, so I'll, I'll, yeah. I take the point. So um, the first thing to say is, uh, um, well, I didn't talk about it in this talk. I actually think that uh, polysemy is this really quite ubiquitous phenomena that spreads out into larger notions of conceptual equivocality. And I've got some um, uh, uh, other papers where I sort of argued that the um, the big problem with uh, uh, the famous Putnam thought experiment was that he just ignored the possibility that the word water is conceptually equivocal. Uh, 
and that you can use the word water in a kind sense to get it H2O. You can also, however, use it to just get it um, a kind of more functional notion that um, uh, is uh, uh, stuff suitable for drinking. I'm also inclined to think that um, uh, when we have uh, what are called you know, so-called you know, coerced uh, count uses of water, so um, uh, or uh, when you go into the bar, I'll have a whiskey. Um, those reflect the fact that you know if you've got you know what someone like Hagit Barer would call a root noun, um, uh, you know what you do with it on a given occasion is uh, is quite open. And so I I actually am inclined to think that um, when you've got these uh, uh, and now let's take not the count version, but let's take the root versions of water and juice, that those expressions are themselves quite open ended. Uh, conceptually, right? So if you think, if, if in fact think about not just water and juice, but like fish and tofu, it's totally possible to imagine a child who grows up getting fish sticks and it comes as a surprise to them that fish sticks come from fish. And another child who for some crazy uh, reason comes to think that tofu comes from walking tofus um, uh, uh, who it saw, who live, live on tofu farms. So there's actually nothing about the meaning of the mass noun fish and the mass noun tofu that tells you, like, is there a correlated um, uh, count noun corresponding uh, to plausible things or not? That's just all real world knowledge. So I'm, in, so I'm just inclined to think that um, uh, if you've got the root noun water, it's going to be associated with some bundle of concepts that, of course, come with it, come with those concepts, that its familiar form is liquid and that it's potable stuff. Now, of course, we all know that water can be frozen uh, and it can exist in, in steam form, but we do have a concept of water, which is this concept of, like stuff you can drink. And likewise, I take it we've got a concept of juice that's stuff you can drink. So I think at the level of concepts, there's going to be a relation between one of the concepts at the water address and at least one of the concepts at the juice address. Uh, pretty hard to think to think. I mean, you can think of frozen juice, I guess, and steamed juice, but it's not the right. Um, and so I think it's only the, the kind of question you're asking is going to carry over outside of grammar and to the $64,000 question of why is it once we enter a, a lexical item, why is it that that lexical item comes to attract the concepts it attracts and doesn't attract other ones? And so why is it that we feel this um, connection between uh, water and uh, juice that we don't feel between, let's say, water and democracy, um, which is another perfectly fine mass noun. But I guess I'm inclined to think that's just all over on the side of uh, uh, of conceptual uh, space. And so, going back to your example, I'd be inclined to think they're equally good so far, and equally good so far as grammar is concerned. And now there's this further question of are they equally good in a particular context? as recipes for building up thoughts that you'd want to uh, express uh, in context. And I think one of the things we just have to get used to in semantics is going to be the distinction between thinking of the recipe as a semantic object that the grammar generates, and then thinking about this other thing, um, a thought that gets built up when you execute the recipe. So you know, I've talked a lot about examples like you know, France as a hexagonal republic uh, in this kind of context. You know, France's hexagonal republic sounds weird in a way that France's hexagonal um, and it's a republic does not. Um, and all those kind of co-predication cases, I think, point in the direction of saying we're just going to have to live with the idea that the, um, the meaning is one thing, the recipe for um, building up something is one thing, and the thing you build up is something else. And so to speak, a recipe can be perfectly grammatical, even if in a context, if you executed it it's not the apple pie you wanted. And I think sometimes we confuse evaluation of the product built 
with evaluation uh, of the of the recipe. Uh, uh, and this too, I think, is just going to have to be something that's going to take a lot of us a long time to um, sort out and figure out how to rewrite the semantic textbooks so that we can make it clear, you know, just like the syntacticians, how to get clear about the distinction in grammaticality and acceptability. I think we're going to have to get clear about the distinction between um, evaluation of recipes and evaluations of um, thoughts constructed. Can I just add some yeah. a little bit to what you were saying about this uh, mass because we touched to that and about the recipes? Yeah. And um, so, do you think? Okay, do you see that you see? I don't know lexical items or words like recipes, right? Yeah. That, yeah that's, that, that, that comes that, with that, some information, right? That's uh, right. For instance, um, uh, it might be an information that uh, this is a count noun for instance, this is count, or this is not count, uh, or this is singular, for That's instance, right. and dog. Uh, uh, I think, even if we think like in Baudet's uh, uh, way of thinking that the root is completely underdetermined, uh, somehow you are going to get this uh, kind of, I don't know, uh, interpretation or piece in the recipe that tells you, okay, this is a singular noun for dog, for instance, right? That, that, that's right. So, so I'm thinking, I'm thinking that the root noun, the roots are um, conceptually equivocal. If I add a count feature, that's an instruction that says, okay, that limits, don't get just anything that was at that address. You've got to get something that's countable. If I add plurality, that adds yet a further uh, restriction. Um, and so, in part because right in the book you mentioned, I wanna go as far as I can about thinking uh, about uh, syntactic complexity as layers of adding restrictions. Um, what I wanna do is think about the simplest expressions, the roots as giving you the widest range of opportunity about what to select. And then you keep adding on, um, uh, adding on uh, restrictions um, from there. But yeah, the, the, the not that all phonologists um, uh, believe this, but this is the picture I, you know, uh, I learned from uh, Morris uh, Halley when I was a great student. You're thinking about um, uh, the pronunciation of expression as this kind of instruction to the articulators. Um, it's uh, 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 a little choreographic score for how to get the mouth moving in a certain way, but it leaves room for a little bit of variation. And it certainly leaves room for the variation between baritones and sopranos, the relevant level of similarity is at a more abstract level than the noise. And so likewise, I wanna think of the meaning um, for a simple expression is this instruction, go get something from the bin, but that instruction can be executed in various ways. And for a complex phrase, now it's build up something by reaching into your little boxes and putting them together in the right way. Um, and, uh, and of course it can turn out that, you know, as anybody who's put something together from an Ikea um, packet knows, um, right, putting the things together can be complicated um, if you've got various um, choices about what to do. Uh, but still, that's how I'm thinking about the meaning. I'm thinking about the meaning roughly as that little picture that like, or diagram that tells you how to build the thing you're trying to build. Um, and at the bottom, you just might have lots of options because it might say reach into bin nine you look into bin nine there's like five different things there yeah uh, I, I get your idea and of course then if you if you, if you keep the um, parallel with phonetics and phonology we will have to think about well what are those atoms that we have absolutely for the recipes for what are the minimal parts that we have to build like do we have atomicity is atomicity one of the minimal parts and no, that... because and also because we have language variation and this is oh i have lots of questions no no so... that, 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 that's great <laughs> let me just jump in though uh, so going back to the uh, uh previous discussion prompted by uh, selene's question um I do think we're going to want to allow for the possibility that even if an expression is grammatically complicated, the child might enter that into their list of memorized things. So from the child's perspective, fish the count noun is this thing that they just store and they, oh, right. And I got various count concepts I can, I can access with this word size thing, fish the count noun. 
And then later, they, oh, you like fish? I can also have fish stuff. Fine. For a different child, it might be um, they start with the root noun and they can access mass concepts with it. It's only later that they, oh, you, you can countize this. And here, I think we're just going to have to allow for the possibility of variation across uh, speakers. Uh, because now what you store in your lexicon and how you project from the lexicon to your concepts, right? The grammar is not going to control that uh, entirely. That will depend in part on your idiosyncratic history. And now, of course, when we move to like different uh, languages, um, God forbid we should consider the polysynthetic ones. Yes, we're going to now have to think very hard about the relation between semantic atomicity, grammatical, syntactic atomicity, atomicity in terms of what's in the lexicon, and as my uh, uh, colleague Omar uh, Premager often wants to stress, right, and what you mean by morphological uh, atomicity, right? These, these could all just turn out to be different things, and such is life. Okay, thank you. There's a lot to be here. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to have, because we have lots of questions. So from Sitali Sanchi says, hi, Paul. Do you think there are elements that are analyzed better with the internalist vision or and others with the externalist vision, like different facts probably? Yeah, good. Well, so let me, let me just stick to this, um, uh, this mass count theme. So um, uh, everybody knows the standard story about how to, uh, accommodate uh, mass nouns from an externalist perspective. Um, you uh, have in your domain um, uh, ways of uh, uh, creating these lattices built up from uh, atomic elements. And then you start asking questions like, how does this work for water? Um, right, uh, 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 it is, is actual made up of H2O. <laughs> um, and you gotta have all sorts of stipulations in my view to um, have, to get that sort of, you know, link style um, uh, lattice structure stuff to work for um, mass, the mass uh, uh, count contrast. And then we've got familiar, um, uh, right, stuff to deal with, like, you know, why, what do you do when hair is uh, a count in one language, uh, not count uh, in another, right? What do you do uh, with, uh, with jewelry? Uh, that, you know, counts as not count uh, in English, whereas like rings and necklaces can't, right? And I'm inclined to think, and, and you know, here in, in, in some respects, um, I'm, I'm just echoing Gennaro, though in other respects, I think um, going someplace he would not want to go. Um, so look, the mass count contrast is a distinction in conceptual space. The, the class count feature or not, that's a distinction in grammatical space. And uh, I think um, expecting the grammatical distinction to map nicely onto a distinction in the world is just not to be had. The, the grammar marks what it marks with either plus count or minus count. And we've, we have tolerably decent ways of aligning that with either count or mass concepts for particular words, but the externalist vision that you should be able to go from elements of the language to elements of the world and complex expressions of the language to complex aspects of the world. Like you're, if you're a philosopher, you're inclined to think Wittgenstein tried this in the early part of the 20th century. It does not work. And um, uh, throwing semantics at it is going to help. So I actually think right there at that fundamental point on a uh, uh, count feature, uh, I'm inclined to think the internalist perspective is the right uh, way to go. Uh, in the uh, uh, book that Roberta kindly mentioned, I think when we get around to thinking about what we all know is the problem of limited polyodicity in natural language, that our standard theories allow us to have expressions of type ET, E to ET, E to E to ET, E to E, to e, to e to that, and, and so on. And we have E to T, E to T, and E to E. To, right? If you think about all the kinds of expressions our standard semantic theories are designed to allow, now there's the question of like, why do we explore such a tiny little space of all that? And why, when you look the quirky space? Uh, and so I think there too, um, the uh, internalist perspective where you're thinking about pairing pronunciations with mental representations and then using the mental representations to talk about the world is just better than the picture that asks us to cut straight from the pronunciations as syntactically structured into aspects um, uh, of the world. But you know, the, the book is my best attempt at trying to 
give a laundry list of respects in which I think the uh, internalist perspective is better. Okay, I have to ask, sorry for Seleni, because Seleni asked me to make the whole question because she put lots of questions, but it's <laughs> one question. Okay. So I hope you remember uh, what was sentence one and sentence two. And, and then, uh, so she goes on, so we can take watermelon juice as substitute for water, but not for watermelon. However, this possibility of playing with quotation marks, X as a substitute for Y, quotation, seems to be somehow compositional. And it, it depends on the predicate the expression is part of or combined with. To me, that's Selene, uh, three is acceptable as, is unacceptable as four is. Three is as for water, I appreciate watermelon juice. Not okay. Four, as for water, I appreciate watermelon, not okay. So what do you think about this? And I think yeah. this, is the, this is the question. <laughs> yeah, good, good. But, um, I, I, I think these are, these are, these are uh, interesting facts, um, but I'm gonna just repeat what I said earlier, which is I think the judgments of acceptability here are involving judgments concerning thoughts assembled and not um, uh, if you like, just the recipes uh, for assembly. Uh, I, don't, I don't think there's any important difference at the level of meaning between water and democracy. Uh, I certainly don't think there's any important difference at the level of meaning between water uh, and watermelon, right? I mean, we're, we, were, we were all taught that, um, right, words like democracy are supposed to be these fancy uh, abstract noun words, uh, as opposed to words like um, dog uh, and cat. But I don't actually see any reason to distinguish um, dog from democracy in any um, uh, uh, important sense of semantic types. I can massify dog and countify um, democracy. What I totally agree with is that in terms of how we feel about the words, uh, they're importantly different. But here too, I think, the internalist perspective is the right perspective to have, because I find it very hard to believe that our judgments uh, about the differences, and I feel them uh, as much as you do, I find it hard to, these are judgments about like how my pronunciations are connecting up to aspects of the environment, as opposed to judgment reflecting, um, oh yeah, look, as far as the language is concerned, water and watermelon, dog and democracy, they're all on a par. But when I project into my conceptual space and have to build a thought, now I'm going to feel um, different about them. This is this is, I think, related to the fact that these you know co-predication cases, like I mentioned, like you know the window, uh, the windows we cut in the wall are nicer than the ones uh, we uh, installed. You know, everybody who thinks about this in, in detail notices some co-predication cases are better than others. So it's not like wherever you have polysemy, you can have um, co-predication of any kind you like, um, uh, right? There's subtle and interesting facts here about how, like which words we feel allow multiple choices from the same bin in the same sentence and uh, which words are such, well, that's just like a bridge too far. And I think the cases you're um, uh, thinking about, Selenia, I would wanna diagnose as interesting illustrations about, huh, what, can we and can't we, or if we like, what, what can we, but only under duress versus can we, and we feel fine about it, do when we're using these recipes to construct uh, the thoughts. And I think that's gonna be an interaction. Uh, that's gonna be some of the interface between grammar uh, and the conceptual system. I'd be very surprised to learn that these are um, gonna be handled by just um, grammatical uh, or semantic distinctions alone, but we can we can um, talk outline. You can send me email and convince me differently. Thank you. I just found out that people are making the uh, they have long questions, but they cannot write more than tw 20, 200 words. <laughs> so yeah. the questions are like this. Um, there is one let, let me let me just say if people like whenever this ends I I I, I have no uh, time constraints today but but like if afterwards if people want to send me by email um, questions I will 
happily respond as I can once uh, I finished grading my exams. Uh, yeah, that's my problem <laughs> now as well. Uh, okay, I don't know when we have to stop, but I have a couple of more questions. Maybe yeah. we can finish those no, no, questions please. and then it's it's the end of it. I still want to make an, uh, one more question before. Okay, uh, so Sitali uh, has already asked, but the, I, it was not the complete question. Um, uh, so the continuation of the question is, okay, um, currently we are including memes that are words in our discourse. All the meaning of a meme comes from a, uh, from a lot of external context. Only who, only who knows the history behind the meme gets to understand the meaning of the words. So in this case, I consider that the externalist vision works better than the internalist. Do you agree with this? Yeah. And that's so, the end of good. this question. Yeah. Good. So, so I started by noting there are many kinds of significance in part because I think um, we often forget that the word meaning is polysemous with a vengeance. Uh, uh, and so, if what one wants to study is a kind of significance that's associated, explicitly associated with communication uh, or with the history of language use or using word um, to direct people's attention uh, to certain things if they know the history of the word, those are things where um, I think it's obvious that what we're going to want are externalist notions. So I have nothing at all against externalist notions of significance. Uh, when it comes to conceptual contents, I tend to be, you know, not about all of them, but about most of them, pretty externalist. Um, uh, I don't think that internalism is the right attitude about significance in general. Um, what I do think, however, is there's this special kind of significance exhibited by human linguistic expressions. And again, it's that thing we get at when we first talk about um, homophony, either lexical or structural, how many meanings. And, and we notice, thanks to Chomsky, that's kind of interesting how many meanings there are, because sometimes there aren't meanings, there aren't meanings you might have expected to be there. That those things, right? It's those things I'm skeptical about characterizing in externalist um, terms. So going back to um, something that came out uh, in the first uh, uh, round uh, with Roberta, whereas I think the standard semantics textbooks set us up for thinking fundamentally meaning is about connecting pronunciations to aspects of the environment. And then you can add some internal architecture if you like and have evidence to do it. Um, I'm inclined to think it's more like, no, no, what we've got is this, um, Th these internalistic meanings. And then once we use them in minds that are connected to the world in all sorts of externalist ways, now we can do things like write the Oxford English Dictionary, which tells me all sorts of interesting things about the etymology of words. And that's germane to how words have actually been used by people in my community. And I don't for a minute want to say we can't study those aspects of use and that studying those aspects of use um, might not be appropriately done in externalist terms. I just would say that um, for humans, I think use is conditioned by the kinds of creatures we are. Um, and so there is a sense in which um, we'd better uh, understand our externalistic uses of language as uses by creatures like us who have the biology we've got and who have the internalist uh, meanings uh, we've got. And, uh, you know, so there's a sense in which my real target here is that David Lewis of general semantics saying, um, here's the right framework for thinking about linguistic meaning. It's a fundamentally externalistic framework. And human languages are just very, very special cases of this thing that aliens could do. And that, I confess, seems to me to have things backwards. It's rather we humans do what we do, and then we can do these externalistic things, you know, maybe even communicate uh, with aliens um, someday. Uh, but I, I am thinking about the externalist stuff as something that's layered onto 
an internalistic base, as opposed to thinking about semantics as fundamentally this, it's all about connecting the pronunciations with the world. And then psychology is an optional um, uh, add-on. Thank you. I have two more questions. Yep. And then, uh, so one question is by Shah. I hope I uh, say Oh, hi. hi. Uh, I was wondering about what we have to say about entailment relations between sentences in an internalist framework. Do we still have access to that notion just as proof theoretical construal? No, great question. So um, I'm actually writing a paper about this. Uh, at the moment. So I think uh, we in semantics need to draw a distinction that's pretty, I think, familiar in the logical tradition uh, now. So, uh, right, as your question already suggests, we can distinguish between proof theoretic notions and model theoretic uh, notions. Um, uh, I like to think about this as the distinction between um, entailment with an I and entailment uh, with an E. Um, entailment with an E is this notion concerning truth. Does the truth of the premise guarantee the truth of the conclusion? Um, and it's a relation that in principle can be characterized in non-syntactic terms, right? It's what model theory um, lets us do. It lets us characterize relations between semantic properties in that Tarskian sense without having to worry about derivability. But then there's also a proof theoretic sense where we talk about notions like derivability. And for me, of course, conjunction reduction, brown dog to dog is a kind of paradigm here. And we can talk about those relations without having to talk about truth and extensions because polysemous expressions can exhibit an entailment with an I relation, even if there's nothing to get your model theoretic hands on. Um, and so now here's our $64,000 question. When we're studying human linguistic meanings and we want to consider data concerning, as we put it, implication relations, is our fundamental job to characterize an internalist notion of entailment that has an externalist entailment symptom sometimes? Or is our fundamental job to characterize the externalist notion of entailment. And look, maybe there's an internal analog of that, and maybe there's not. Again, David Lewis of General Semantics offers us uh, the second picture, uh, right, developed by Montague and uh, uh, students in uh, various ways. And the internalist picture is much more uh, going to be going for, no, come on, we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to figure out what's the right human natural analog of um, uh, proof theoretic uh, procedures. And you know, I talk about some of this in chapter two of the book. There's this very old tradition going back to Aristotle and the medieval logicians and then resurrected um, by Van Bentham uh, and uh, other people uh, 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 in the Amsterdam uh, tradition of natural logic. Uh, and uh, you know, I think that's all kind of reconstructable uh, in pretty simple proof um, uh, theoretic terms. And unsurprisingly, I, th I think that's the real natural phenomena uh, and that talk of entailment and the model theoretic relations, this was like, this was a kind of like, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a way to characterize the facts initially without worrying about the psychology. But again, I think the, the textbooks lead us to believe, but those are the real facts and psychology is the optional addition. Whereas I'm thinking, look, the real facts are the psychological facts and the model theoretic description was just that model theoretic description that we probably need to get past if we're going to um, really treat this as a branch of cognitive science. Thank you. And yeah, so uh, that reminds me of a, a distinction uh, also between logical uh, um, contradiction and grammatical contradiction that yeah. people are exploring. And I think yeah. those. Okay, so the, uh, there is a, a last question about uh, from, from Professor Marco Rufino. Uh, was, there, was there any notice difference in the most many blue yellow answers if people were exposed to longer versus shorter time to the diagrams? Good, good. So in the initial um, experiments, um, we limited everything to a 200 uh, millisecond window 
in part because that's a kind of known window where you've got to use your approximate uh, approximating system. There's not enough time to count, um, but there are fantastically precise models of like what does happen in, in that window. And so it wasn't like, it wasn't that we thought the 200 millisecond window was the magic window for semantics, just that we had, there are really good models of what happened in that window. And so you can like to like run the experiments. Um, uh, but then obvious question, right? How much um, does what you learn from restricting people to that window uh, generalize? What I can tell you is that even in the initial experiments, going back to those early uh, 2009, 2011 papers, what we found was that um, it wasn't like the other strategies for answering the most question were not available in that window. In fact, if you explicitly got people to try to use a one-to-one -one strategy by enticing them to like, just focus on the dots of one color and tell me if there are any leftovers, not only could they do it, they could do it better than they could do the most question, even at 150 milliseconds. So it's not like it's not like the 200 millisecond window is an especially hard window for humans to uh, deploy these um, um, strategies. But right, um, uh, obviously you want to get out of that window. And so all the experiments I uh, described where it was like compare, uh, contrast, um, uh, either sentences on a single picture or pictures on a single sentence, where the stuff with doing the iPad, those were completely time uh, unrestricted. I can also tell you we've just done just as reality checks, um, uh, uh, rerunning all these experiments, uh, or at least a bunch of them with no time restrictions at all. What you find is that people will, will take a little longer to answer, but not that much longer. And really interestingly, not long enough to count. Like even if you tell people, <laughs> where people just want to answer. Um, and uh, you, really, you, you almost have to pay people to laboriously count out the dots. Um, uh, and uh, uh, compare them. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, given this, this stuff has now been replicated in a number of labs and, and in other Engl languages, Polish it turns out to be sort of more or less like English with regard to its uh, most uh, uh, more kind of distinctions. So uh, Barbara Tomaszewicz uh, and her group has replicated all this stuff um, uh, in Polish with slightly different um, uh, time frames. You know, I can't tell you for sure the time frame makes no difference. What I can tell you is that when we muck with the time frame a little bit, it doesn't make any uh, difference. And the and this was the stuff I really wanted to bring out in the last ten minutes. The contrast that we were predicting, let's say, between most and more, turns up in this variety of tasks. Some of which involve picking a picture. Some of which involve picking a sentence. Some of which involve making a picture. The same contrast keeps turning up under no time pressure at all. Uh, and that makes me think, yes, it's that the words are just understood differently and it doesn't make, um, uh, now your question involved the word many, which I got nothing to say about right now, uh, but I'll tell you we're working on um, uh, similar things and might have something to report in another um, uh, six months or so. Thus far, uh, it's been about most, most versus more, and then the most recent stuff about uh, comparing each every to all. You Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is my real, real last question, but yep. it's so interesting. There are so many things to talk about. Of course, most and more, they're, let's say, functional words. And when you talked about polysemy, you were yep. talking about lexemas, right? And yep. um, uh, I, I, I just want to know whether- No, no, that, 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 that's, that's great. So uh, 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 given another 15 minutes, I would have said something about this. So um, there's a kind of interesting feature of the standard and externalist picture. So if you think about it, the standard externalist picture says, look, you can have your concept of dog and I've got mine and they might differ. And don't we really want to abstract away from that and say, all that matters is the dogs. So when it comes to the open class lexical items, the standard picture says the word has to have an extension. And we're not quite sure what to do about polysemy, but it's okay if different speakers have different 
um, concepts or ideas, as long as they um, uh, apply to the same stuff. When it comes to the logical vocabulary, right? Now, all of a sudden, um, the standard um, picture is saying, um, look, uh, uh, everybody's sure to have, um, uh, uh, speakers of the language could have wildly different ways of representing the most relation. Um, and uh, uh, we're fine with that because in fact, uh, 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 we're, um, we're the uh, externalists, the team of saying, look, even an individual speaker might um, uh, verify these claims in different ways in different circumstances, because what did the individual speakers care? It, the, all that matters is you pair the word with the right function, how you've represented is up to you. Um, and so uh, part of what part of what really interests me about this is that the standard view has it that all the interest in the quantifiers, again, of course, lies in the mapping between the pronunciation and the function. And uh, details of the representation have nothing to do with the meaning. Whereas if you are an internalist, when it comes to the logical vocabulary, now you might think, look, that's a special vocabulary. That vocabulary might just project to the mind the way it has to project. So actually here we should be prepared to find out there's no polysemy or at least not conceptual equivocality of the sort the externalist is sort of assuming. So uh, if it turns out that when you turn to the logical vocabulary, what you find is an absence of conceptual equivocality, that's, uh, I think, a kind of interesting um, fact to discover. Uh, and um, uh, then you, of course, want to ask the further question, is there stuff people know about the meaning of the logical vocabulary words that really reflects the specific format. So uh, uh, Tyler Knowlton, who's the lead article, lead uh, graduate student on these uh, uh, most recent paper, he and I are uh, working on some uh, a paper about conservativity uh, at the moment. Because of course the standard theory uh, uh, says, um, we're, uh, you represent the meaning of the logical uh, expressions as relations between first order uh, predicates and, um, uh, how you specify that relation, that's up to you, you know, toss in your favorite um, general version of generalized quantifier theory. And so what Tyler has some uh, data not yet um, uh, published, but I think it will be soon, um, showing that you can actually test whether or not people um, uh, understand the quantifiers in, in these relational ways, or if we really do fundamentally understand quantifiers as restricted quantifiers, so it's not the relational conception, it's the old restricted uh, conception. And I think he's got some pretty uh, clear cut data uh, suggesting uh, the latter uh, and that this is uniform uh, across uh, the quantifiers. So I, I think in about, uh, in a few months, we're gonna have a paper, the argument of which is gonna be um, uh, quantifiers uh, are just not under, they're not even understood relationally. And in the talk, I think I made reference to a, a assault proceedings and it's got the, it's got the germ if you, people want to chase that down, it was last year's um, SALT proceedings. It's got the germ uh, of the uh, idea there, but he's got some, he's got some beautiful um, follow-up experiments suggesting, no, uh, when, when you understand the quantifiers in a very specific format, and the format is the same, the general format is the same across each, every, and all, uh, but then within that format, you get room for sub-distinctions, and they get exploited by... Um, each, every, and all. So I, yeah, I'm. This is this is for me like the place for the next year to be thinking um, in terms of exactly what the differences are between the uh, 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 functional vocabulary and the open class vocabulary on the uh, opportunities for conceptual uh, equivocality. And of course, I'm hoping this is going to be more grist for the externalist uh, perspective will predict none of this and an internalist perspective will let you um, uh, get, get a handle on this. Thank you very much, Paul, for this interesting and nice uh, lecture. I'm sorry, but we are running out of time. So uh, thank you, the audience. Thank you, Abralin, for you all. And please continue attending Abralin online. Come, it's very interesting. And maybe you have some final words you would like no, to just, make some final just, remarks. Or... No, just uh, thank, thank you for you know, doing this um, series and, in, and inviting me. Uh, the discussion 
uh, was great. It was uh, and really good for me to um, uh, prepare this material for this uh, audience. I really enjoyed the discussion. I'll just read what I said before. Uh, if people want to have conversations, please feel free to uh, email me. Uh, you can find my email on my website if you don't uh, know it. Uh, and uh, once I get my grant exams done, I will be happy <laughs> to respond to you. Uh, uh, but thanks very much for the invitation. This has been great. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you, Abralin. Now I don't know how you we finish this. Uh. <laughs>